All right, we're going to get back to building the motorhome and doing mechanic work on it in the next episode. But uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about all the engineering that went into this upgrade that I put uh, on the motorhome in the last episode because it is super interesting stuff, you guys. Even if you don't think that you're interested in an engineering discussion, I think you're going to like this. So let's get into it. So if you're an experienced mechanic and you're torquing down nuts and bolts to something that just feels right, I mean, I guess you can get away with it, but it's pretty poor form. And I wasn't going to proceed without knowing the correct torque values. Thankfully, I was able to find those. This table right here has most of the numbers that I'm going to need. And also on page 597, here's the spec for the lug nuts. That's the stock setup with the hub piloted, hub centric wheels on these metal hubs. 250 foot pounds of torque. That's crazy. For context, a typical passenger car with like aluminum alloy rims are torqued to like 80 to 90 foot pounds. And the Alcoa rims on this, you know, GMC motorhome, which is a, you know, higher weight vehicle, 12,000 GW VR, uh, 150 foot pounds. So 250 foot pounds, my gosh, I've never seen a value this high. What on earth is going on here? And this discussion is going to have everything to do with the hub spacer. This thing that I kind of poo pooed in the last video at the end there. You guys see this feature right here, this flange, this lip, that is the alignment device for hub centric or hub piloted wheels which is the type of wheels that came stock on these motorhomes back in 1978. Hub centric versus lug centric, which is by far and away the standard. I'd say 99% of cars out there these days have lug centric rims. And that's why the torque specs are lower and have never seen a number as large as 250 foot pounds. But you know what guys, I personally would prefer hub centric or hub piloted wheels. And here's a little visual aid that's going to help me explain a mistake I made in the last video, but also the reason why I think hub centric are superior. If I want to hold this piece of aluminum bar stock in place and I try pinching it with my fingers, it's real easy to get it to slide in between my fingers. Heck, I can even put this in a vise and hit it with a hammer and it's still going to slide. The obvious answer there is to put a hook on it and then when I try to get it to slide, it can't slide past the hook, either here in my fingers or in a vise. Now, of course, I could torque down the vise really, really hard to a point where it would overcome any of the forces uh, being imparted on the bar with the hammer. So that basically means that I'm going to be deforming the end of this aluminum before it's going to slip in the vise. But how tight do I have to get that vise? Here's a hint, 250 foot pounds tight. But what if you don't get those lug nuts torqued down sufficiently on this hub centric style wheel attachment? Well, the rim will float around the lug nuts because the holes for the lug nuts are actually pretty big, for the lug studs, I should say. And so because there's that float, the hub center hole is actually much tighter tolerance, which means it floats around the lugs and the center flange here catches the rim and keeps it from moving. So in effect, you have sort of safety device where Mostly you're pinching to keep it from moving, but if the pinch ever lets go for some reason, it comes to the catch and it stops. But the primary engineering force, the idea of the design from the get-go is to have those lug nuts pinching that rim so intensely that you don't get any movement. And the primary reason for the existence of this flange on the hub is just to center the rim during mounting. The secondary purpose is this safety catch. So if your lug nuts come loose, as mine were, you guys remember that I drove all the way down into Portland and all the way back with loose lug nuts and all I heard was a clunk clunk and there was no real damage, right? So I actually lived through this experience. If I had had a lug centric wheel attachment on the motorhome at that time, I would have done severe damage to the whole system. The studs would be fatigued, possibly breaking off. The rim would be damaged. So there's very little forgiveness in lug centric designs. Now I think I have the best viewers on all of YouTube and a couple of you guys were really politely disagreeing with me and having a fantastic discussion, just an amazing civil disagreement. And I love it. Thank you guys so much for chiming in. So starting with Kent McKean here and ending with MC or Mr. MC 71, um, you guys basically called me to task 
ask on my statement that the hub flange is the primary weight bearing feature of a hub centric or hub piloted wheel. That's not true. It's the secondary safety mechanism. Mr. MC71 there found this fantastic and pretty much unassailable write up um, in this scientific engineering journal by James D. Varen, where he really goes to town and talks about all of the difference between hub piloted, hub centric, and lug piloted or lug centric wheels. I learned quite a bit reading this article, but one of the most important things is the existence of this style of lug nut. You see this corner down here that looks like it's detached? That's because it is. That is basically a strangely shaped washer, which allows the clamping force. So the washer clamps to the face of the rim while the rest of the lug nut is able to spin. And this means that more of the spinning motion gets transferred into clamping force and less of it is there to overcome the friction of the twist. I don't have this style of lug nut. This is what came on my motorhome and it looks somewhat similar. It's got that nice flange to it for a good, good flat bearing surface, but this is one solid piece. There's no built-in washer. So if I'm gonna stay with the hub piloted wheels, I need to find some of those. But the most important takeaway that I gleaned from reading this article is actually the very first sentence here in the abstract. The frequency of vehicle accidents attributable to wheel attachment failures on light duty vehicles was extremely low prior to the advent of cast and forged aluminum alloy and forged styled steel wheels in the early 1970s. So forged styled steel wheels means uh, the, the stamped steel wheels that you get today that have that sort of conical profile built in around the lug holes so that they are lug centric or lug, lug piloted as well. So the bottom line here is that in practice, we saw an increase in wheels falling off of vehicles, causing crashes, causing highway deaths when we switched from hub piloted to lug piloted wheels. So the, the hub piloted wheels are safer because they're more idiot proof. And that means you guys need to all go out there and check your lug nut tension. One more interesting thing that I learned reading this article is if your lug studs are fatigued because the lug nuts have been loose and they have like microscopic cracks in them and they're going to fail because it's, it's all about fatigue failure, torquing them down to the correct specs can actually freeze that uh, fatigue life. It can, it can totally just whatever damage has been done, it just stops it right in its tracks. And uh, well, apparently, of course, the science is still out, needs to be get out on there, but there's some um, evidence that suggests that. I'll put a link to this article in the description. But we're not done talking about this hub spacer yet. Here's this fantastic YouTube channel. You guys have all probably come across it. Engineering Explained. The guy's got 3 million subscribers and yeah, he's just wonderful. So, and he did a whole episode about hub spacers. But the typical application for a hub spacer is just to make wheels mount wider on your car, just for style kind of a thing. And in that application is where everything that he's saying applies. But in this application on the GMC motorhome, some of those generic criticisms for hub spacers are not applicable. Specifically, I'm talking about the scrub radius. Look, Engineering Explained did a whole video on this subject as well. So I'm not gonna explain it. Go watch his videos in the description. We're just gonna talk about this diagram, which I've made in my CAD program. Now, this is not set in stone. I need to double check these values and actually measure things more precisely. To get the, the diagram that you're seeing here, I used a carpenter's tape measure and just sort of like eyeballed for square to get a rough measurement of where everything is situated. And here's the bottom line. This hub is like three and a half inches wide, but it's only accomplishing a two inch outboarding of the wheels. So an inch and a half of this is basically just there to get us back to the stock wheel position and then two more inches to give us that extra width. And the stance or width of the tires is not the only variable that's changed with the new components. You can see this line here is more vertical than this line here. So this represents the stock steering axis, which is 11 degrees apparently, whereas with the new uh, upgraded, you know, you know, whole steering suspension system that I've installed, we're uh, 
we've changed to a 16 degree steering axis. And you may be wondering where I got this information from. This is a write-up from, I don't know, several years ago. People have been doing this one ton conversion to their GMC motorhomes for like 15 or 20 years. And so uh, the original guy seems to be Bill Hubler who did it. And then this guy, Stan Edwards, sort of built upon Bill's work. And I bought my kit from Manny, who uh, is again sort of upgraded it or, or uh, changed it, iterated upon it. And I think this is a guess, but most of these iterations are manufacturing considerations, not changes to the design. And in his write-up here, Stan included what looks like kind of a technical drawing of both the stock and the uh, upgraded or you know changed modified suspension systems. So trusting his work here, we see a five degree increase in the steering axis. Now this increase is gonna affect what's called bump steer. And bump steer is the fancy term for the force that wants to straighten your wheel out. So if you go around a corner, you turn that steering wheel and you let go of the steering wheel and the steering wheel automatically unwinds and gets to where the motorhome's driving in a straight line again, that's your bump steer. So the more steering axis you have, the more forceful your bump steer is. And what that means is that the more forcefully you're having to fight against the suspension to get the motorhome to turn. So by increasing the steering axis, we require more force into the steering wheel, which has the effect of putting more wear and tear on your power steering pump. But I don't hear of a lot of guys blowing out their power steering pumps because of this five degree increase, so I'm not worried about it. Of course, if you really think about it or model up the steering axis effects, then you're gonna find out that there's one other uh, kind of drawback to increasing steering axis, and that is the fact that the wheels might be perfectly vertical as you're driving in a straight line, but as that wheel turns, it's actually leaning outwards. So with a five degree increase, it means that as I go into a very sharp turn, like I've got the wheel spun all the way around, that wheel, as it's turning, is already going to be leaned over five more degrees than it would have been from stock. So this can put some stress on the, the whole wheel attachment system, this aluminum spacer, for instance, and that's not good. So basically, if I'm doing tight turns, I'm going to do them very slowly. I'm not going to be taking this thing on the racetrack anytime soon. So back to scrub radius, that's the distance from where the steering axis here meets up with the ground, with the road, and where the center line of the tire meets the road. And generally speaking, we want a pretty small scrub radius, but you do want a little bit of scrub radius. If those two lines intersect perfectly, then you get a little shimmy. So a little bit of scrub radius is good. Now, according to those quick eyeballed measurements that I took, the scrub radius on the stock setup was about one and three eighths inches. Whereas the scrub radius with this wheel spacer is about a quarter of an inch and that's actually superior because decreased scrub radius means decreased torque steer. What's torque steer? Okay, torque steer is when you're pedal to the metal accelerating or when you're braking and one of the two drive wheels doesn't have as much traction as the other one. What's gonna happen is that truck, that wheel, like let's say it's this wheel that's gripping, it's gonna be pulling more. And with a larger scrub radius, that's basically a larger lever arm. And so it's not just pulling the car straight forward, like the whole thing's moving in and out. It's actually trying to pull this wheel around and turn it around the scrub radius. So by limiting the scrub radius, it has less of a, of a leverage to, to try to steer, uh, uh, steer the wheels. And in torque steer, if you guys have ever driven a car with some pretty bad torque steer, uh, like I got in my friend's sports car that had really severe torque steer, and I just slammed on the accelerator, spun the tires a little bit, and that tire had less grip, and the whole wheel kind of tried to jerk out of my hands. It turned the wheel about 45 degrees right there in my hands, and I had to fight it back. So scary stuff, which can happen under both braking and accelerating conditions. So Actually, whoever set this up uh, did a good job compensating for torque steer. But the major problem has nothing to do with any of this. It's that two inch offset beyond stock. So once again, there's a lever arm. There's a two inch lever arm. And you wouldn't think that just two little measly inches is gonna have that much effect when the coach has a GVWR of 12,000 pounds. Well, it does. And it affects what's called your spring rate. So that spring, the torsion spring, um, basically starts to move and then it resists movement at an ever-increasing rate. 
So when you get towards the end of the travel where the wheel is almost bottomed out, the spring should be much more stiff so that you're resisting that bottom out. So an engineered perfect spring design would basically take your maximum force that you're ever gonna be going under in a suspension loaded condition. Like you go off a jump or you hit a pothole or whatever it is, you hit a pothole while you're turning and all the weight of the vehicle is on that front corner, this kind of a thing. So what's the maximum load that's ever going to be put on that corner, that would be your top spring rate. So you want your bottom spring rate to be this nice, comfortable, plushy ride, and the very end of your travel, that, that much spring has been uh, twisted up, that end of that travel, you want it to be more than the maximum load that's ever going to be put on that corner so that you never harshly bottom out the suspension where it reaches a metallic clunk because, you know, that's the end of the travel. So the engineers who designed this coach did something like that. And by giving the coach two extra inches of leverage, we've effectively removed that top end. So now the spring rate is not gonna reach that maximum moment. And it, at the bottom end, we're gonna feel it as well. And I was actually clued into this behavior from this wonderful comment left by Bruce Hillsop, who told me that with his modification, he's got that same spacer on his, on his motorhome. And what happens is when he's under braking, the front end of the motorhome dives down. And that's entirely attributable to those two inches of extra lever arm out there at the front. The spring rate on those torsion bars is just no longer tuned for the suspension. So once again, this is a case of never deviate from stock. We see that deviating from stock in one thing, the steering axis or the wheel spacing, means that you have many knock-on cascading consequences and you have to change all kinds of other things about the rig. Mainly here, we wanna change the springs, but I have no idea what size of spring I want, what the metallurgy is on that spring seal to get just the perfect spring rate. Like that is a lot of R&D and where would I even buy such a thing? So I'm stuck with the stock torsion bar spring. But this is engineering after all, and there are always solutions. Here is one attempt. This is actually done by Manny, the same guy who I bought my kit from. And I guess he was experimenting uh, with Jim Bounds. This is a few years old. I found this picture on the internet. And that crazy cylinder that you're seeing right there is actually an air spring in place of the you know oil shock absorber, the dampener. So that's pretty creative. And what it does is it allows you to add some PSI, which is adjustable, how much pressure you put in there. And that adds to your spring rate of the torsion bar suspension. This would be another way to achieve that same effect. You can see the airbag there on top of the upper A arm. So I could put an auxiliary airbag at the front, but I would need to build a big old box to uh, apply the downward force to the top of the airbag there. Still totally doable as long as I could weld that box on there. The problem that this is gonna cause is what's the perfect pressure to run those airbags at to get the right height. And as you go up a mountain, <laughs> that increasing pressure inside the airbag because of the, the, the decreasing uh, atmospheric pressure as you, you know, increase elevation is going to cause the, the suspension to lift up. And as the suspension lifts up, the camber of your wheel as it lifts in its suspension is going to change, which is going to alter the way that the motorhome handles. So if you're going down a real steep hill at elevation, you might have like kind of the worst suspension setup possible. So on top of all the complication of adding a whole extra airbag system to the front end, you've got those sort of like real world, you know, usability considerations and it's, it's not, it's not ideal. So the bottom line to me is once again, never deviate from stock. And even though this spacer does outboard those front wheels so that they are tracking perfectly true to the rear wheels, which, you know, what I covered last time, it's going to track better in like rutted roads where the tractor trailers have put the depressions in the lane for those few miles where I'm going to, you know, encounter those, those types of problems. I don't think it's enough of a benefit to have that increased dive. And if that's my judgment that I want to be back to the stock wheel spacing, how do I accomplish this? Here in my CAD drawing, you see this green line that represents the spacer here on the one ton upgrade. The far left drawing here would be the stock setup. And this is the one ton upgrade as it currently stands. So if I decrease that spacer by two inches, I'm basically right back where the wheels we're tracking in the stock setup. But I can't just bolt on a smaller spacer because the stock wheels are not large enough in diameter to clear the brake caliper for the larger brake rotor. 
even with this current spacer, I can barely even get a piece of paper in between my rim and the caliper on the brake. So clearly I'm going to need larger rims. The steel ones that I have, as well as the aluminum Alcoa rims that everybody else seems to upgrade to, are 16 inch rims. And as you can see, they actually clear the back of the brake caliper. Where I'm getting the close tolerance is not here at the edge of the rim, but actually right there in the middle where the profile gets thicker. Now, the real problem is going to come when I inboard those two front wheels two inches in order to get back to the stock wheel position. You can see the clearance issue around the tip of the upper A-arm is going to be a thing. So I constructed this cardboard mock-up gauge to see if the rim is going to collide with the steering linkage. The answer seems to be no, but it's not by a wide margin. I've currently got just under a half of an inch clearance between this tip right here and the um, nipple, what is it, the Zerk fitting there on the linkage. So when you account for the thickness of the rim, which is probably going to be about a quarter inch bumped outward, because keep in mind this eight inch wide rim is an inner measurement. So the outer measurement is an extra quarter inch wider, assuming they use quarter inch sheet metal to construct the rims. That means I only have a quarter of an inch clearance around that nipple. And that's not much. This is an 18 inch rim drawn with a now 1.75 inch spacer. And you can see that the tires are lower, lower profile. So what does that mean? Relative to these tires here, the sidewall on the tire is shorter and that comes at a cost. So the tires are like pre suspension with a higher profile tire. They roll over rocks. They deform and squish over obstacles before the suspension even activates, which is quite nice. And by decreasing the, the profile, we lose some of that pre suspension. So the ride becomes more harsh in the vehicle. Now, Lower profile tires look mean. They just look so cool. So I wouldn't be opposed to this. The motorhome rides so nice as it is. I could lose a little bit of uh, ride quality uh, in exchange for some really great looks. Let's talk about the benefits to what I've drawn. You can see here the overall height hasn't changed. And that's very important because in the rear, the, the two wheels there need to be able to clear all that center hardware for the the crazy airbag suspension back there so if you get bigger than 30 inches or 29 and a half inches which is the stock size you're going to have problems so we really want to keep the front and the rear wheels matching so that we can carry only one spare and it will also look right if you had a really big wheel in the front it would look bad so this is what we want and you can see here that i've crossed the steering axis over the center line on the wheel, which gives us what's called a negative scrub radius. And that's actually more desirable. So because the motorhome is so long, I don't think that the advantages of a negative scrub radius are gonna be anything worth talking about, but it basically doesn't affect anything. Negative scrub radius, positive scrub radius, doesn't matter. So what you see here is a negative scrub radius that's the same distance as my rough calculations of the stock scrub radius, which means we're never deviating from stock. We're back to the geometry that the motorhome was designed for. And best of all, it means decreasing the width on the hub spacer to about 1.75 inches. So quite small, which is awesome, but you still have, uh, you know, the extra set of lug nuts holding the spacer to the hub. To torque down the inner lug nuts, you're going to have to take the front wheel off entirely to check those. So that's a really big hassle there. It would be nice to get rid of the hub spacer altogether. So let's talk about that. If I could find a rim for the front that was different from the rims in the back where the rim could bolt directly to the hub and eliminate the hub spacer, that would be awesome. Uh, I could even use just a single size of spare on the back of the motorhome because I could carry a hub spacer for just the times when I need to use the spare tire. So this is truly the ideal solution, but making it happen outside of a CAD environment in the real world is, whew, that's a challenge. Now, I started off trying to solve the problem by attaining rims. So I figured out that there's basically 19.5 inch rims. It's a standard size from like the trucking industry, but the size of tires with 19.5 inch rims is greatly, greatly limited. And they're also 
overbuilt. The tires are 14 ply. That's kind of the, the load rating. And so they're not going to be as supple or nice of a ride if you could even get them to fit on the motorhome, which you can't because the tires are all 32 inches in diameter and we need a 30 inch or 29.5 inch tire. So after hours and hours on the internet searching for rims that would work, I gave up that and went to go look for tires that would work. And that's really where I should have started in the first place because if you think about it, we have an outer bound, that being 29.5 inches. We have an inner bound, which is an 18 inch rim. And now we just need to get the width right and then the load rating. So I definitely, if I'd have been using my head and strategically planning out my workflow, I would have started with tires in the first place. This website, tiresize.com has been instrumental fantastic source of information, really well organized, and I really could have done uh, all of the work right here. So you can see the tire size that I've landed on, 235-65R18. If we do a search for 110, we find 13 different options. That's a lot of choice for us for our motorhomes. But we need to talk about this magic number, 110. Back to the 1975-76 maintenance manual on the motorhome for the official guidance about tires. Keep in mind that they were using bias ply tires when they wrote this, but the load range, you can see it right there, load range D. The other information we need from here is the tire size on this weird old bias ply tire standard is 8.75 by 16.5, which means that the overall height on the tires is 29 and a half inches more or less, and the width on the tires is a little less than nine inches. That's sidewall to sidewall. A quick Google search shows us that a D rated tire is rated for up to 2,335 pounds, otherwise known as a load rating of 110. You can see here is a chart of all the load ratings. There's our 110 for 2337, and 106 is another interesting increment there because that is 2,094 pounds. And if you can bump the load rating down, like you're gonna underload the motorhome, then you could definitely go with a get away with a 106 load rating. And the tire selection is enormous if you're gonna go down this avenue. So this is awesome. We found a tire that will work. It's half an inch taller than what the stock specification called for. It's also half an inch wider than the stock specification. That's from the widest point on the bulged out sidewalls. We can deal with a little bit of extra girth and height. It's not gonna be a problem. The problem is in finding a rim. I can tell you right now that you're a better man than me if you can find a stock, like off the shelf, already manufactured solution that will work for us. The tire is a 235, whereas the stock would be a 225. So that extra half inch in width means we need the rim, the metal rim to also be wider. We can get away with only a half inch wider rim, but we can also bump that up to as much as eight inches. So now that we know all this, how are we gonna get rims? We're gonna have to get them custom made. And I have found quite a few custom steel rim makers in the United States. Like three or four of them happen to be down in the Central Valley of California, and a couple of them are in the Midwest. Near as I can tell, the absolute rock bottom price that I'm gonna pay for a custom steel wheel is probably around $350. Maybe as much as $500? We'll see when I call these guys. So I might end up spending $5,000 or more to get these tires mounted to custom steel wheels, and that is a lot to pay to avoid using a hub spacer. By now, some of you are questioning whether or not I should even have done the upgrade uh, to the front end here, and you've got a good point. So what would be the other option? Well, the number one reason to do this upgrade is something that I have kind of just been glossing over, and it's those front wheel bearings. See, this motorhome only has 60,000 miles on it, and the bearings are already bad. So they go bad all the time. And the rule that you know my dad came up with is never deviate from stock, but that goes right out the window when the stock solution is terrible. The first version of independent front wheel drive uh, front suspension was 1963, I think. It was the Corvette. So this motorhome came out in 1973, only like 10 years later, and they had to be working on this front end right around the same time as the Corvette was coming out. So it was all very new, especially for such a robust front wheel drive system. 
uh, for context, front wheel drive, or I'm sorry, four wheel drive trucks at this time were solid front axles. Even all the way up into the 1980s, big burly four wheel drives had solid front axles. So this very robust front wheel drive independent front suspension thing did not have all of the kinks ironed out from the factory. But if I didn't mind replacing those front wheel bearings, hey, I could do that every 40,000 miles or so. Just need to get the specialized kit. It's not the easiest job to do. I think you pretty much need to pull off the entire knuckle every time you're gonna replace those. So I could have found new bushings to replace the dry rotted bushings. Uh, got the kit for replacing the, the, the wheel bearings. And just, you know, like people who own Volkswagen bugs or buses, for instance, plan on replacing the engine every 40,000 miles. So what's the big deal replacing the bearings every 40,000 miles? And the CV joint issue that I've been sort of obsessed with uh, also is not too, too hard to solve. I can just get custom half shafts, drive axles made that use um, a more modern, uh, available over-the-counter CV joint instead of whatever came stock on this motorhome that you can't get anymore. So these half shafts, the drive axles that came with this kit are custom. So that's really not a hard thing to accomplish. So there are other ways to uh, get this functionality and not have changed the, the steering and suspension the way that I have. Of course, there are other benefits to the one ton uh, upgrade. So it is much more burly. I feel much more confident towing and that increased brake rotor gives me much better stopping power, which is awesome. Especially if you're driving in traffic, anybody who's driven a big rig in traffic knows that cars cut you off. That's just what they do. And so you're constantly sort of panic stopping uh, in, in, in heavy traffic situations. So that gives me a really big peace of mind to have that extra braking. And part of the diving of the motorhome under braking might be attributable to the increased braking force. I think it's mostly going to come from the lever arm uh, acting on that spring. But uh, yeah, it's just a consequence of, of having you know a better stopping vehicle. The only thing I have left to figure out is how much that diving behavior is really going to bother me. So I'm taking this on you know, somebody else's word. I haven't actually experienced the dive for myself. I don't know how bad it is. And of course, there is always the extra airbag that I talked about. I can still implement that solution. Uh, if I really hate the dive, I can just keep the stock wheels and tires and add that extra bit of spring rate with an auxiliary air system and hey I already have the tank for it so uh, I think it might add some interesting functionality to be able to lift and maybe level the motorhome if I pull into an unlevel uh, camping spot that kind of a thing it's not going to lower it terribly although I could make it so that the whole motorhome lowers down about maybe two inches to make it that when you're stopped and camped for a long period of time your step up into the motorhome is just that much lower so I don't know it could have some interesting um, benefits. So it's still something that's on the table as an option, but for now I think I'm just going to crank up the spring like everybody else does and see if I can deal with it uh, with the sort of like reduced spring rate and the diving behavior. But the final thing I want to mention is the fact that I can barely get a piece of thick cardstock paper here in between the brake rotor and I'm sorry the brake caliper and the rim, which means that if I'm under some sort of like leaning condition or if you know things flex as you're driving so it's highly likely that this rim is going to rub that caliper under steering conditions and Manny tells me that the caliper is plenty robust I can grind it down I can give myself a little bit more clearance or alternately I can get the Alcoa aluminum rims and I'll give myself extra clearance by just upgrading, upgrading to those aluminum rims. But I, I, you know, for all the reasons covered, I do love these steel uh, hub centric rims. So I think I'm gonna grind down that caliper and call it a day. Right, so these are my Patreon supporters and I am tremendously thankful to this small group of wonderful people. Thank you so much. If you like the discussion, maybe you'd like to see some of the work that I've done on the motorhome, here is a binge watchable playlist for all of the upgrades that I've done so far to the rig here. And this down below is the link to the Patreon page if you want to help me keep making videos. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.